Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. On today's video, I'm going to be going through a grammar paper. It's the Key Stage 2 Year 6 grammar paper uh, where children are assessed on their English grammar skills and knowledge. Um, I'm going to do a walkthrough of every question in the paper uh, so you can see what kind of questions they're going to be asked and the kind of knowledge and understanding that they'll need in order to really do well on this paper. So, let's get into it. Alright, so here we have the grammar paper and we've got question one here. So a lot of the grammar questions will ask children to identify a certain type of sentence. And here you can see it's given you four options. And the question is, um, which of these sentences must end with a question mark? So the idea here is to identify the sentence, which um, is a question, basically. OK, because obviously if it isn't, it could be a statement which would end in a full stop. Um, an exclamatory sentence would end with an exclamation mark. So we're looking for a sentence here that's a question. So if you read through these, OK, you can see that some of them are one of them is a question. So did she play tennis on your team last year? That is quite clearly a question. It's requiring an answer. All right. It requires an answer. So this is your question. So that's the one that should have the question mark. This one here is designed to try and trick you. I wonder what time the next train arrives. This is, sounds like a question, but it isn't actually a question, okay? It's just an aside. It's a thought that somebody's having. It's not actually a question, okay? But this one is a definite question. So the only thing to be careful with here is read each one very carefully because there'll be one that is quite clearly a question, all right? Question two, a fairly straightforward question. This is um, assessing the children's knowledge of suffixes. Okay, a suffix is a part of a word that goes at the end. Okay, so it's um, something you add to the end of a word to possibly change its meaning. Okay, so it's about adding the correct suffix to the correct root words over here. And if you do just go through these, you'll be able to put these together and then if they make sense, if they sound correct, then they're the ones that we're joining up here. So accomplishment, joyful, forgiveness and foolish. OK, and if and if you were to read them, if I was teaching this to a child, I would go through and, and ask them, do they make sense? So accomplish full. Have you ever heard that word before? No. Forgive meant no joy ish. Definitely not. Fullness. No. So by process of elimination, you can go through and then get them to join them up correctly. All right. Once again, another question on sentence types. This time we're asked to identify the questions and the commands. So for each of these sentences, we have to tick whether we think it's a question or a command. Now, a command, um, as I've taught it, particularly to younger children, I've usually said it's a bossy sentence. It sounds like somebody's asking you to do something. OK, and being quite bossy about it, like a um, an army general or sergeant. Um, now, in, in a bit more detail, you would look to see, does it have a imperative verb? OK, a doing word, which is asking you to do something. So whichever, if it has an imperative verb, then that is also a good indication that it is a command. Do your stretches before you exercise. That's being bossy. So you can see here. It's saying to do something. All right. So this is our command. Do you prefer tennis or cricket? Interestingly, they've started both these sentences with the same word, but this is quite clearly got a different feel to it. This one. Do you prefer tennis or cricket? That is a question. OK, you're asking for an answer. So that's our question. Do the boys always go running in the morning? Once again, we need an answer here. So that is a question. Do take some water with you to football practice. Interesting, this one sounds very similar to these two, but actually, once again, do take some water with you to football practice. It's telling somebody to do something. It's that bossiness that tells us it's a command. OK, the next question is the first one where we're looking at um, a puncture and type of punctuation. So a comma, insert one comma into the correct place in the sentence below. Now, for these questions, um, the children should have learned that 
sentences you sometimes can start with a fronted adverbial which will tell us how when or where or, or the manner in which something happened and after a fronted adverbial the grammatical rule is that we should have a comma so here you can see every night comma dad and my brother take the dog for a walk so that is the correct place for the comma in that sentence there'll often be a question where um, there'll be a fronted adverbial, a sentence starter with a missing comma, and that's where it should go. But that's not always where the comma should go. Just in this instance, there's not one after the front adverbial, so we need to put one in. Front adverbial, if you're wondering, okay, you may have called these sentence starters in the past, but grammatically they're known as fronted adverbials as we teach them at the moment in the English curriculum. All right, next one, question five. Draw a line to match each prefix to the correct word to make uh, a different word. Now, once again, just like suffix, which goes at the ends of a word, prefix goes at the beginning. And again, it can change the meaning of the word. So we've got the prefixes inter, dis, semi, and anti. And again, we have to join them up to the correct root word, which is over here. So I would once again, with a child, go through this and say, well, which ones have you heard of before? Which ones sound like they make the most sense? So interproval, no. Discircle, definitely not. Semi-social, mm, possibly. Anti-action, no, don't think so. So then go through dis-inter-action. Now, if that's not the first one and most obvious to them, then get them to join up the ones they definitely know first. And then you'll be left with one that, that must be correct. So dis, yeah, I know that gets disapproval. Semi-circle, yeah. Anti-social, I've heard of that one. So inter must go with action, okay? Question number six. Which sentence must not end with an exclamation mark? Now, just be careful here. They've put the word not in bold for a reason. And that's because you're looking for the one that does not end with an exclamation mark. Notice that in the previous question, we were looking for the one that was a question. Now we're looking for a sentence that must not end with an exclamation mark, okay? So we're looking for a sentence that is not an exclamatory sentence or you just wouldn't have an exclamation mark at the end. Now, you really must wear a coat, all right? Possibly this would have an exclamation mark. What a dreadful day I had. That is an exclamatory sentence. The clue is that it begins with what, okay? If you want more videos on what an ex exclam exclamatory sentence is, I can do those for you. But that is an exclamatory sentence, so it's not this one. What is the temperature now? Aha, right. Well, that is a question. We need to answer that, don't we, by giving the answer of what the temperature is. So that definitely would not end with an exclamation mark it would end with a question mark, which gives me the idea that that is the answer. But just to be safe, the wind is very strong today. Oh, that sounds like it should have an exclamation mark. So this one exclamation, this one exclamation, and that would be the one that is not having an exclamation mark. Question seven. There's a few of these questions on the test, but this one, it's about um, standard English. So it says circle the correct word, in each box to complete the sentence in standard English. So here, um, it's basically asking which of these sentences, okay, um, in, in each sentence, which word would make them make sense, all right? Now, it may be that the tense has to be consistent, therefore it would be that word, or um, the subject-verb agreement, okay? It needs to make sure if it was plural or singular, Whatever it is, it has to be consistent throughout. Now, the best way to do this is just to read it with each one and then ask the child which one makes the most sense. So pass me them cartons, please. Pass me those cartons, please. So here we've got those. You sang that song very good. You sang that song very well. That's a tricky one. Some children do say very good. You sang that song very good. But in this instance... By the time they get to year six, hopefully they'll notice that that one is the one that makes the most sense. We always did our homework on time. We always done our homework on time. So this is a uh, past tense. All right. So we can't say we always done our homework on time. 
The correct word here is we always did our homework on time. All right, so that's the tense. And for the because it's past tense, we need to have the word did there. Insert a relative pronoun to complete the sentence below. Now, if your if the if your child doesn't know what a relative pronoun is, then they're going to find this word this question very tricky. So, relative pronouns are words such as which, who, whose, that, and they're used in sentences. Um, relative clause, all right, where we add extra information into a sentence. So here, everyone loved the music. Something was played last night. So if they know what relative pronouns are, they could even write them in a list just underneath and then decide which one they think would fit the best. So everyone loved the music which was played last, last night. Everyone loved the music that was played last night. So out of those words, which one do we think makes the most sense? Now, I've had children not really been able to work out which one they think it is. Um, everyone loved the music that was played last night. I think I would go with that one. Okay. Right. On to question nine. In which sentence is lock a verb? So this question is all about word classes. And specifically, we're looking at the word class of verb. Okay. Now, some people will say a verb is a doing word. But that's not always the case because was, okay, is also a verb. And that isn't specifically something you do, okay. But what we're looking for essentially is um, the, the word, the, the verb lock, is it being used as a verb in this sentence? Because lock could also be used as a noun, okay, um, as in a name of something. I should close the box and fasten the lock right here. They've tried to make you think it's being used as a verb because um, it's Aisha's doing something. But the verb in this sentence is actually fastened because that is what she's doing. And in this in this sentence, lock actually becomes the noun. It's the name of the thing that she's locking. OK, make sure you lock the gate before you leave. In this sentence, where is what function is the word lock playing in this sentence? Well, Gate is the noun, all right, and lock is the thing that we're doing. We're locking the gate, the noun. So lock in this sentence is the verb, all right? Now, just to be sure, okay, it says tick one here, but I'm going to just make sure that I got that right by looking at the other two. I think I need to buy a new bike lock. Bike lock is a noun. It's an object, so it's, we're not doing the locking in that sentence. The lock can only be opened with a special key. So once again, this is lock as used as a noun. So we were correct. It's that sentence that we need to tick. That's the, In that sentence, lock is being used as a verb. Question 10. Insert a semicolon in the correct place in the sentence below. So a semicolon is a type of punctuation which is stronger than a comma. Okay. And it can separate two parts of a sentence which stand alone. So almost having two um, main clauses, two parts of the sentence that make sense on their own. And um, we sometimes would say that in the place of a semicolon, you could have a coordinating conjunction such as but, and, so, or, okay. So if you could put this in the space, all right, but instead of using one of these coordinating conjunctions, use a semicolon instead, then we know that um, that's where the semicolon would go. So the best thing to do here is just read the whole sentence and think about where would I take a long pause? A longer pause than a comma, a more powerful punctuation would be required there. So Frank would like to go to Cornwall next summer. He might also visit France in the, sing, uh, in the spring. So if I was to take out... If I was to put a conjunction in here, I could put and in there, couldn't I? Frank would like to go to Cornwall next summer, and he might also visit France in the spring. But instead of having and, instead of having that coordinating conjunction, I could actually put my semicolon in instead, all right? It's a longer pause than a comma, so it's a stronger punctuation than comma, but a semicolon would be appropriate in that instance, okay? So it's that place here where you would place your semicolon. 
All right, next question. And it's the first question where we're introduced to parentheses. Um, and in this case, brackets. So parentheses are um, is a word we use when we're teaching the children about adding extra information to a sentence. And we can use dashes, we can use commas, or we can use brackets to go around the extra information. So we're looking here, it says insert the brackets in the sentence below where the extra information has been added. So let's read it. Now what you need to be thinking about is if I took the brackets out, all right, would the sentence still make sense without them? Using public transport, such as buses and trains, can reduce pollution. Now if I take that section out, such as buses and trains, does the sentence still make sense? Using public transport can reduce pollution. Yes, it does. So that means that that bit there is the additional information that has been added. Therefore, I need to make sure that my brackets go around that additional information. Using public transport, in brackets, such as buses and trains, can reduce pollution. Notice also how this section of information, the brackets, just gives us more detail about what public transport is. And that's another good indication that it's additional, okay? It's, give, it's giving more detail as to what we've got here, okay? The public transport. Just in case people weren't sure on what public transport was, it gives you some examples. So often parentheses will, will give examples of things or give additional details. Sometimes birthdays, dates, people's names, okay? It's additional information that you've added into the sentence and you can take it out and the sentence can still make sense on its own. Question 12. What does the prefix multi mean in the words multicultural, multipurpose and multicolored? So here, once again, we're, in, we're looking at the word prefix. A prefix is a part of a word that goes at the beginning. All right. Um, and prefix, OK, when placed in front of a root word can change the meaning. So what, how is this word, this prefix multi here, change the meaning of these words multicultural, multicolored and multipurpose? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because for this question, children might use some inf um, some knowledge that they have of outside of school. So maybe they've seen their parents use a multipurpose spray. You can use it on many different places. Maybe they know that um, multicolored means many colors. Multicultural is a place, could be a place, um, could be a word to describe London even. OK, so if I go down here, which which is the meaning of the prefix multi? Well, if they know anything about these words or they've come across the prefix multi before, then they should know that it means many. Now, if a child has never seen any of these words before or come across the prefix multi, these questions can be difficult for them. OK, so again, question 13, we're introduced to dashes again. Um, like I said on that previous question, so dashes are what's called parenthesis. And just like brackets or commas, we can use them to add additional information. So um, here we're looking for the sentence where dashes are used correctly and they should go around the additional information. Similarly to the other question about the um, public transport, it gave us more information on what that was, buses and trains. Let's read the sentence to see which one gives us additional information where the brackets are used correctly. I will be running, dash, a half marathon, 13 miles next week. Mm, just doesn't make sense, does it? I'll be running, I will be, dash, running a half marathon, 13 miles next week. Still doesn't make sense. I will be running a half marathon, 13 dash miles dash next week. This makes it sound like the marathon is called Marathon 13. So definitely not that one. I'll be running a marathon, 13 miles next week. Sorry, I'll be running a half marathon, 13 miles next week. Okay, here you can clearly see the marathon, the half marathon. Okay, we've added the additional information of, of the distance and the dashes have both gone either side of that additional information. So it is this sentence where the dashes have been used correctly. And even reading these other ones and pausing where those dashes are 
you can see that it just doesn't they just don't make sense okay so your dashes should go around your additional information one at the beginning and one at the end okay which word is an antonym of difficult right so as part of grammar the children should be learning what synonyms and antonyms are interestingly i've i've noticed that they come across synonyms quite a lot when they te when you're teaching them writing they're always trying to find synonyms and for, for, for new words um, to avoid always using the same word. So it's, it's a skill and, and a word they've come across before. Antonym, not so much, okay? But basically, antonym is the opposite of synonym. So it is a uh, synonym is a word that means the same, whereas an antonym is a word that means the complete opposite. So we're looking for a word that means the opposite of difficult out of these four options. So if I look down, once I know, once I understand what antonym is all about, so it means the opposite, opposite of difficult, hard, no, that means the same, that's a synonym, impossible, no, I wouldn't say that was the same meaning, because difficult doesn't mean impossible, challenging, well, challenging means the same as difficult, so that's a synonym, so which one's the opposite of difficult, and it's quite clearly easy, okay? Right, so question 15. Which sentence is the most formal? Now, during their English lessons, children will often um, be asked to write in year six, um, both formally and informally. Formal writing is writing that you're writing to someone that usually you don't know or somebody of significance or importance. So maybe a letter to the queen or if you're in school, a letter to your head teacher. So it's important that they understand what the features of formal writing is. Now, one of the features of formal writing is that you would never use a contracted spelling. For example, a contracted spelling of do not is don't. Okay, now don't would be a feature of informal writing. Like, more like you would write to your friend, okay, I don't want to come out to play today, but if you were writing to a head teacher about a particular issue, I do not think we should wear school uniform. Do not is much more formal. It's not a contracted spelling. So that is a feature of formal writing. There are no contracted spellings. Informal writing will have contracted spellings. Now that's a big clue now. If I can find the sentence here that has no contracted spellings, then I know that that is the most formal. The way they played was ter terrible, wasn't it? Contracted spelling, that's not formal. I wish they'd put a little more effort in today. Contracted spelling, um, not formal. If only they'd tried harder, we, they, a bit harder, they would have won. Two contracted spellings, not formal. The team were defeated due to mistakes that they made. Okay, gosh, that sounds so different, doesn't it? No contracted spellings. We've got words like defeated, okay, mistakes, much more, um, a different kind of language used as well. Okay, so that will be our formal sentence. Tick one box to show whether hyphen is needed in the sentence below. Okay, a hyphen, not to be confused with a dash. Um, a hyphen goes between two words that could be joined together. So we're looking for um, um, two words in this sentence which could be joined by a hyphen. All right, um, so the class teacher praised the well-behaved and helpful group of year six children. So it's actually giving us some different options where we could put the hyphen. Helpful group, no, they're, com they're two separate words. Class teacher, well, they should have seen class teacher written many times while they've been at school, and I have never seen it written hyphenated. I hope that you haven't either. I hope that they haven't, so no, no, no hyphen here. Year six children, another bit of writing or phrasing they probably should have seen at some point while they've been at school, and six children, I've never seen hyphenated. So our only other option is, well behaved and yet we could be joining those two words with a hyphen so that's where that hyphen is going to go all right question 17 what word class is him in the sentence below joseph's friends rush to meet him desperate to see if he had won now this is their um understanding of word class again so when i say word classes i'm talking about adjectives verbs nouns prefix um, prepositions and um, also pronouns now 
A pronoun, the clue is in the name, really. So noun, if they know that noun means, okay, a name of something, an object, person, event, place, okay, you can have proper nouns. It's got something to do with nouns, but look, we've got the word, the, the prefix here, pro, pronoun, okay? So I'm looking for a word that is possibly going to be next to a noun or replacing a noun. And the a pronoun actually replaces a noun in a sentence to avoid repetition. So instead of saying, Joseph's friends rushed to meet Joseph, desperate to see if Joseph had won. You don't want all of that repetition of the word of the name Joseph. So the words him and he are pronouns. They replace the noun. OK, so pronoun is what the word him is in this sentence. Question 18. Circle two words in the passage below that are synonyms. So synonyms, um, we've looked at antonyms already in this paper. They are words that mean the opposite, whereas a synonym are two words that mean the same or have a similar meaning. OK, now I did find this question quite tricky because sometimes they put words in there um, to try and trick you, but also they don't make the synonyms really obvious. So it's not going to be um, something like sad and unhappy. All right. It's going to be two words that are a bit more tricky to, to link the meaning. So having queued for over an hour, Sanjit found that his tolerance was being severely tested. Most of the other children had lost patience and gone somewhere else. Some gone elsewhere. So, I mean, it's given two quite tricky words here. Patience, they should have seen before. So they should know what that means. But the word tolerance is not a word they've seen often. Now, they're the ones that are the synonyms. They're the ones that are the closest in meaning to each other. But once again, so important that they have widely read in year six, because if they read widely from a range of different books, the idea is that they'll come across lots of different vocabulary. And by building that up, it'll help them to answer questions such as this. OK, so that was the first part of a two parter on the English grammar paper key stage two. Um, it's quite a long paper, actually. I was so surprised at how long it was when I first looked at it. Um, so the second part is coming up. Um, please go back to the channel to find part two of the grammar paper walkthrough. I um, hope you enjoyed it. hope you got some value from it. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more um, videos and request any other videos that you would like. So see you in the next one. Thanks a lot.